Yeah. Sure. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so I'm Keith Jerome. I'm the head of UW Virology and a professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine, and that's K-E-I-T-H-J-E-R-O-M-E. -E. Um, and so today we're talking about some new testing that's coming on at the University of Washington, UW Virology, and this is serologic testing, and that's a fancy word essentially for looking for the body's response to the virus. So we're looking for the antibodies that the body makes when it has been fighting off this virus. This is a really important new type of testing that we haven't had access to before. Previously, we've found the virus itself, so that's great if you're dealing with someone who is infected right now. But one of the other big questions we need to understand is, has a given individual been infected in the past? We've all heard these stories, right? Somebody says, well, I was really sick in February. Uh, did I have COVID? And we haven't been able to tell them. Once you're healed, the virus goes away. Um, but the body's response, these antibodies actually continue on afterward for weeks and probably months afterward, and we can detect them. So um, this is the new kind of testing we're starting with today, or, or that we're, we're talking about today. Um, and part of our ability to offer this early comes from UW Virology's long collaborations with test manufacturers and in test development. So. Uh, for many, many years, we've worked with manufacturers to understand how their tests perform. Uh, we work to make sure that they work as well as the manufacturers say. Uh, we work to help them understand and help our doctors understand exactly how to interpret the tests and how to use the results. Um, and we've done that for a long time, and because of our track record, UW Virology was able to get early access to this kit from Abbott. And fortunately, we had the instrumentation already in lab that it goes on. So we were a, a very logical place to, to look at this. Um, and so we were able to evaluate the kit. Um, Alex will give you a few more details here in a moment. Um, but I can say that in our own hands, uh, the test seems to be very, very sensitive. That if a person has had COVID, the test detects them with a very, very high degree of reliability. Um, maybe even more important, the test seems to be very, very specific. That is, if you've had some other virus, even one of the old other coronaviruses, at least in our hands, we're not seeing any false positives with this test. And Alex will tell you about a series of over 300 specimens that we had stored from the pre-COVID days and tested, and none of those came back positive. So this looks like a really uh, fantastic test. The other reason we were excited to work uh, with Abbott on this is that we not only need a test that works, but we need a test that can be delivered to hundreds and even thousands and maybe tens of thousands of people. Uh, the instrumentation we have in lab right now could do 4,000 of these samples a day, 4,000 of these tests. Um, within just a couple of weeks, we'll be able to do 12 to 14,000 a day. And this starts to get us to the point that we can make a difference um, in the population of, of our area, get people back to work, and sort of give them back uh, the lives that they were hoping for. So as I mentioned, we've done some uh, a number of experiments really looking at the performance of this test, and there's a lot of details about how it works. So I'm going to hand it over to Alex now, who really led those experiments for us. Great. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, so my name is Alex Grin... All those guys? Oh, okay. All right. Apologies. Thank you. Anything else? All right. So... Uh, my name is uh, Alex Greninger. I'm uh, assistant director of the clinical virology lab and assistant professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine. That's uh, A-L-E-X, and then Greninger is G-R-E-N-I-N-G-E-R. -E -E um, and so for the last uh, three or four days, we've been you know, evaluating this kit from Abbott. We've run about a little over 400 specimens through it so far. Now, I said the package insert uh, that they, the studies that Abbott did, over uh, 1,200 specimens, showed a sensitivity of 100% and a specificity of 99.6%, which is uh, quite quite excellent, it's much better than uh, a lot of the other tests right now on, on that are being distributed, uh, especially some of the finger prick tests that the uh, FDA is, uh, they've registered with the FDA. The studies that we've done first, uh, we worked with our uh, colleagues in the immunology division here in the department. Uh, they had been following some uh, patients who had were PC known positives, and they had evaluated with other kits, uh, the Euromune kit, uh, as well as a laboratory developed test that they had. Um, and they sent those samples, and this assay was able to detect all, all of those positives, which is a good sign. 
Uh, we ran it, uh, just one thing, we ran it against um, 50, 50 pre-COVID-19 specimens, no cross-reactivity there. And then we ran against 355 uh, excess sera samples that come to our clinical lab uh, for mostly for hepatitis serologies. You know, if you work in healthcare, you have to have a hepatitis B serology. So there's all sorts of reasons why people get those serologies done. We found 14 positives. Of those, about half of them were uh, people who were in the hospital for COVID-19. Um, so it found those cases, uh, people developed immune responses, they'd been in the hospital. Uh, and then it found some people who uh, had test actually had a high prior clinical suspicion, uh, were evaluated for COVID-19, some even tested uh, and um, had, a, had a negative PCR test. Um, so we, we also tested against uh, uh, human, other human coronavirus positive patients. These are unique sera that are available with our colleagues in the Fred Hutch and also in the immunology division, people who had uh, prior infections, PCR positive for other human coronaviruses, and we had s s uh, blood sera uh, serum available from them and then we did not see cross-reactivity to those specific sam samples. So based on these studies, uh, it seems like the seroprevalence in the area, it's you know, hard to extrapolate from this particular population. This is a very uh, biased population, things that are in, the, in, our, in our hospital lab, but it's, it's low, right? It's uh, probably somewhere between one and 2%, but that's sort of just a initial estimate. We'll find out more as we're able to run this on a better, like, better selected population for sort of general epidemiology purposes. And I think this really means that, um, one, the test seems to be performing quite well um, in our hands, as Keith said, and it really indicates how many, how dangerous this virus is and uh, how many people are still at risk uh, currently. Now, again, we don't know, there's certain things we don't know about these IgG, and, uh, and other viruses, these antibodies are protective. Uh, you won't get reinfected. The genetic diversity of this virus is limited currently, but clearly just from doing this test, we don't have, know the answer to that question definitively, but this will be the test that allows us to generate that data to understand um, those important questions clinically. Um, I don't know if I forgot anything else, but uh, happy to take any questions. Yeah, we can take questions. Okay. So the test, um, like any other test for this virus, will need to be ordered by a healthcare provider, a doctor, another registered healthcare provider. Um, that might be a person's own physician. That might be uh, a, a, a health uh, clinic within a workplace. Uh, there's a variety of ways. And one of the things we're going to be trying to figure out over the coming days and weeks is how do we best roll this out to get the best information that really allows us again to, to reestablish uh, the economy and, and people's social lives. And so that's going to be something that we want to figure out. Uh, but the first step is to have the testing available. Is it a swab? Is it a blood test? Ah, this is a blood test. This will require a blood draw. So this is a needle in the arm. Uh, not, a, not a large amount of blood will need to be taken, a couple of ml. Um, and that'll be sent to the lab for this testing. Do you have to be symptomatic? No. Because you don't have, because you're testing Um, well, um, uh, the accessibility of the test is, is through a physician, so if a physician feels like it's warranted, um, that'll be available. Um, this test is not well suited for people who are symptomatic. Um, these antibodies take time to develop, so um, typically they might take five to seven days or even two weeks for some people before these antibodies appear. So if you're sick now, you need the test that looks for the virus. Um, this test is most useful to identify those people who have had the infection previously and are better. And remember that from everything we know about the other viruses, having previously been infected is probably, and I say probably, going to give you some protection from future infection and future illness. Now that's the, what degree that protection uh, happens is something that uh, the entire medical field is trying to figure out now. But having these antibodies is clearly going to allow people to have a higher degree of confidence. For example, being a first line health provider, uh, being a first line in the grocery stores, all the people who are at risk right now, this can allow some of them to have more confidence in their day-to-day -day lives. Are you able to backtrack into some of the cases that are already out there that you have samples for, like in nursing homes and things like that? Oh, we're really very interested in studies, absolutely. Um, UW Virology's always been not only providing clinical care, but 
helping us understand how these viruses work and how we can deal with them. That said, the first priority now is making sure patients get what they need now. So all the research studies take a second tier. They're very important, but they stand behind that. But I think there'll be plenty of opportunity to do that. Ah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, the sort of sample that this uses, it's sort of the leftover fluid part of the blood, not the cells in the blood, but the fluid part. Um, and that's a very common thing for scientists and in, in healthcare facilities to store for a while. So actually there's quite a bit available from that time and we'll be able to go back. And that's how we were able to do the studies and study samples from before COVID even occurred just to make sure that it didn't have those false positives because some of that has been stored in research studies and other things that we were allowed to use. Um, so this, the, so the virus that causes COVID-19 is a virus called SARS coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2. Um, and this test does tell antibodies from that from other infections from other types of viruses. It's very specific for this. So we work very closely with our colleagues at Seattle Flu Study and they're outstanding scientists. Um, so a lot of what they have are nasal swabs at this time. Uh, there are a variety of sources that do have some of this blood and we're, we'll be working with everybody. And so it'll probably, it'll be bigger than UW Virology, it'll be bigger than Seattle Flu Study, it'll really be, um, I, ideally this will be a national, a nationwide effort to really understand when this got started. But remember, we were the first place. So everything that we can tell points us toward the middle of January for those first introductions and this will give us a way to confirm that. Yeah, you, you, you could do drive-in phlebotomy uh, to speed it up and to protect healthcare workers. It is hard to do self-phlebotomy right now um, to draw your own blood. Um, but, uh, you know, we'll see what happens in the coming months uh, for other tests that might be available for, like, finger prick. But right now, this is a venipuncture test, and that's the volumes that we, we need for this test. Is that something you would be pushing for as a doctor to have this ease of access to this kind of test? Make it easier to have the walking... I, yes, I think it's very important uh, to have this to have this testing. I think you know it's a low seroprevalence, but uh, I think people want to know, and it helps us understand uh, more about this virus. You know, and that's some, that's how we learn about it. Honestly, is by doing this testing. Right. So the, the population that we're studying is admittedly very biased, right? So we're looking at, you know, people who have blood specimens in the clinical virology lab. Um, so that's a, you know, I don't want to extrapolate too much from this, but I do think it sort of gives an idea of approximately, you know, ballpark what, what the numbers are. And we need to do more studies here in the coming weeks to understand in a more sort of general population what the, what the seroprevalence is. But I, you know, let's say we didn't find 30% of people with antibodies. And it's a question with its asymptomatic transmission that, you know, that's, it's helpful to have this data with the serology tests. Uh, I'd also say that we can, we don't have to go back with this virus, this test, sorry, this test sort of allows you to see retrospectively, right? So we don't have to go back to samples from November, or December. We can, um, you can use frozen samples on this test, but uh, at the same time, you, you don't have to, you can actually look. And one of the benefits of this test right now is that this virus has not existed in human populations. It's only been here for about three months. And so the people who have had the virus have very strong antibody responses. So we'll, we'll be offering this in the first part of next week. So there's, uh, there's a, a few last things that we're ironing out in terms of getting the results back to people uh, in their healthcare providers. Um, but you'll see this test early next week.
Exactly. People will be going to their doctor's office. They might be going to the health nurse at their place of, of employment. They might be going to a health department. There's a variety of ways, and we're willing to work with anyone, but it needs to be someone who's capable of doing that blood draw. There's a limited, finite amount right now of testing you can do, so I, I, I go back to priority. Everyone's going to be going to their doctor to be tested, please, and then all those samples will be coming to you. How much, what's the priority? Well, I think that's, so, that's an issue we dealt with in with the viral testing, um, and I think some people would argue we were almost too conservative on who we tested early on. Um, so this will be broadly available. We're building capacity to do a lot of tests. Uh, I suspect from our previous experience, it takes time to ramp this up. People will hear there'll be uh, people want it, but you've got to get an appointment. You've got to get in. There's only so many bloods can actually be drawn at a given location every day. Uh, so people aren't, uh, realistically, not everyone's going to be able to get this test next week. Uh, that's just the reality of things. But we also need to understand how is this most useful for the average person who was never sick, doesn't think they had it. There's probably not a lot of utility in using up one of these testing slots to say, yeah, you never had it, and you still should be wearing the mask like we've been doing all day until we started this uh, this conference. Um, so we do need to make rational decisions about where is this test going to be more most useful. And again, I think frontline people who are at places of high risk really should be tested so they know their status. Um, keeping workplaces safe, for example, is very important. Places where people have to be in close contact. These are all places where this can be used for. And again, I want to make the point that the, this gives us another fantastic tool to really get the sense that we're, we're starting to turn turn the tables on this virus a little bit. We can find the virus, we can also find who had it and, and find these antibodies. And this allows us to then do this sort of tracing, this control, this containment of the virus that I think is what we need to do to, to start getting our lives back. But I think of workers who are trying to decide whether to reopen, this may be a requirement to come back to work. Um, it's possible that this could be part of, of workplace uh, back to work efforts. I think there's a question here. Uh, yeah, so this is based on ICD antibodies, right? Yes. Right. Tested ICM and the presence of that in terms of the you know, protecting the infection from the coronavirus. So our, our department has, has a, a few IgM tests that they, they're looking at. Um, right now, like you said, this test is an IgG test. Um, IgM tests can be a little bit more cross-reactive, uh, just a little bit more sort of binding to other other antigens. So right now, we're going to go with IG, this IgG test, and and we'll look, we'll continue to evaluate the IgM tests. Oh, the ones we were looking at were just from the last week, right? Because we actually want to test more current specimens to give the most amount of time for those antibodies to, to develop. Like, like Keith said, you know, really seven seven days after, you know, the virus enters someone is, is really when you start, begin to develop these antibodies. So it's actually helpful to wait a little bit longer time period to allow them to develop. And then to add to Alex's question, we did have a, a, a set of samples that were collected before there was COVID anywhere, so before this was even in China. So we were able to go back before this virus had jumped into human beings and look there. And those are the samples where we were very relieved to say everybody was negative, exactly what we'd expect. But you may have heard some of the news, some of these serologic assays that have been been put out there by other manufacturers haven't performed very well. And so we wanted to be very, very careful to ensure that this assay performed to the level we expect. Yeah, yeah. So these have been compared to uh, two two different tests right now in the Department of, of, of Laboratory Medicine. Um, the the advantage of this test is that it is uh, is very analytically. You can run a lot of samples in, in a day, right? So you can run a lot of lot of tests, and that and 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 the and the, and the, the uh, test characteristics are quite quite favorable. Having a hundred percent sensitivity, ninety nine point six percent specificity are are really fantastic results. Agreed. <laughs> what? Well, yeah. So I think you've seen there have been a couple of really big 
landmarks during this entire COVID outbreak? We, when we first started to understand there was a virus, and then we understand it transmitted through people, and then we un understood it started to get to other countries, and then it came to our country and it happened to come here in Seattle. And all of those were milestones, and all those things were bad. And then UW Virology started offering a test for the virus, right? And then other people offered tests and we started to get more and more testing and that was great. Um, and you saw what we put out uh, earlier in the week that we've reached the, the peak right now and we seem to be on the far side of this curve. That's another landmark and that's good. And I think what you're hearing today is yet again, we have another tool. This is another turning point in the fight against this virus. Yeah, so Alex mentioned some of these other tests that have been developed uh, by our colleague Mark Wenner in the Department of Laboratory Medicine, um, and he's evaluated these. And those have been used uh, for the last couple of weeks. They're kind of harder to do. You can't do thousands of them. And they've been used to identify people to, to provide this plasma f as a therapy. So these are people to identify people who've already made the antibody. Maybe if we take some of their plasma off and give it to the sick people, they'll get those antibodies and do better. So those other tests have been used for that purpose. They'll probably still continue to be used for that purpose. That's not very many need to be run in a day. And again, for this test, we're talking about literally testing thousands of people every day. This, this test will help us identify those people to get other testing to be able to ha uh, come in and potentially give convalescent yeah. uh, sera. Absolutely, be very helpful in that way. It's one of our, our first you know drugs that we can give here. So the supply chain has been an issue through the virologic testing, as I'm sure you have all heard. Um, and how we approached that was by having a very diversified uh, set of tests. So if one test ran out of some reagents, we had two or three other ways to do that same testing for the virus. Um, to some degree, we have that here. And I've mentioned our colleagues at, in the department who have some other ways to do it. Um, it's hard to match this volume of testing, the amount that we can do. I will tell you, we have been assured that this pipeline is robust um, and that, that we'll, we'll be supplied fully with what we need. Um, generally, Abbott has been a fantastic partner over many years and provided high quality reagents and very good service to us. So we have every reason to believe that that's true. Um, and, and, and if we do run into issues, we'll, we'll go to some of the other tests and get through as much as we can, um, but it will be difficult. Yeah. Well, one of the advantages of this platform is that you know HIV, hepatitis B, hepatitis C are all run on this platform, and so they're used to making millions of tests a year. And, and so that the supply chain is uh, in the order of millions of tests uh, per, per month. What's next? That's a good question. So, I think for this particular test, we, um, you know, this is a great test, and we need to. The next thing is going to be under, actually understanding how the the drugs and, and getting vaccines. One of the, this 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 uh, this test will help us identify people for convalescent sera, which will be helpful, and we need to start seeing the data from the, the therapies and the vaccines. Um, so, diagnostically, this is uh, yeah. one of our our best tests that we can offer right now. So, Alex and I have been appearing mostly in these sorts of things as diagnostic virologists telling you telling doctors what viruses they have but we're also deeply involved in the research of these viruses um, and so we're very deeply involved in the trials for therapeutics and also um, for the vaccines so a lot of that particularly as the vaccine studies start to advance and we start to ask questions about are they working we're part of those teams that will be uh, determining whether these things actually work. So what's next is really turning the tables on this virus, coming up with therapies for the people who are infected now, and ideally coming up with a vaccine that's going to prevent uh, people from getting infected in the future. It's going on right now. Yeah, Yeah. no, the, some of the trials have already started, many of the trials have already started, and even more under development. Um, and we're receiving samples in the lab right now from, from these trials. 
mean, you know that uh, you may know that every day we report how many clinical tests do we do and what proportion of those are positive. And the number bumps around a little bit, but if you kind of statistically smooth it out, you can see we rose and then we came down. And that's all based on the clinical work that we did. Um, but remember that there's a tremendous amount of testing that we're doing at the same time that's simply in support of these research trials. So these never go into those clinical counts, but these are the test of hydroxychloroquine uh, for, for people uh, shortly after exposure. Does that actually help them uh, prevent ever getting sick? And we're doing all the virology for those studies, for example. So those come to us, and uh, there's a tremendous amount of work that's going on behind the scenes. Um, and we're open 24 hours a day, and uh, you know I, I have to call out the people who actually do all this Amen. stuff in the middle of the night. Uh, literally at 3 a.m., there are uh, med medical laboratory scientists in the laboratory doing this and just trying to keep everybody healthy. I just have one more basic question. If someone tests positive, if someone tests and they have the well, that's a great question. What does it really mean to have an antibody here, and, and what does that imply to what you can do? From everything we know from other viruses and other coronaviruses even, having those antibodies should give you some protection. It may not be perfect protection, and what I mean is that it might might be possible to get infected again but if you did you wouldn't end up in the hospital okay you might feel a little off but then those antibodies pop right back up take care of it and, and, and you're better so you got infected but it didn't really matter it's more like a regular cold that's a very possible outcome from what we know about other coronaviruses these antibodies probably don't protect you for the rest of your life so that they probably last for a year or two maybe three but these are all maybes. You can listen, you know, Tony Fauci's been on the news saying exactly these same things. These are our best guesses of what we think will happen with this virus based on what we know about other viruses and, and other closely related viruses. But it's too early to be sure. And, and so there is some caution we're going to give everybody. And it, don't overinterpret these. Don't go have big coronavirus parties or whatever just because you got this, this test result. It, and this actually brings up another point I want to make. We are all dealing with uncertainty in this virus, and we're all trying to learn, and questions about how many people in Western Washington had it. What's the, we would, medically, we would say, what's the seroprevalence in Western Washington? We know exactly how to make that study, how to do it. We will do it. But to do that study would take us a couple of weeks, maybe even a couple of months to get that perfect scientific number. I can say with confidence is exactly this. What we need right now is some answers, right? So we're giving you guys answers as quick as they're coming out with all the caveats around this isn't the perfect experiment. Alex told you in a, in a, a what we would call a convenient sample, samples that have come to our lab for other purposes, we're seeing maybe three or four percent positivity. We extrapolate that to say we think that means that the general population is probably more like one or two percent in Washington. That's There's some uncertainty there, but it gives us an answer now and it allows us to take action now without waiting for the perfect answers that would come potentially too late. Yeah, so uh, we get the serum in the lab. If we get blood, we have to make the serum out. If you have to spin it, that takes like 10 or 15 minutes. And you can put it on the instrument. It takes about 20, 25 minutes. So from an analytical standpoint, it's very, very fast. The instrument can report uh, a three results a minute. Um, and we have multiple of these instruments in the lab. So, you know, that's the hard part here is going to be getting the blood. Oh, no. We have three different instruments, right, that we can use for this test uh, that we could run it on, and so that allows us even higher throughput. And it'd be one one specimen per person, just one one two of blood per person. Is that what your question was? Yeah, it's well, you say detecting. You said it could detect all these other things as well. I didn't know. Oh, I, I just meant it could do three different people in a in one minute, like uh, three different things. That's about it can do about three to four thousand uh, a day. Thank you.